and a very warm welcome to the health webinar brought to you by JK Yog and Radha Krishna Temple of Dallas. As we commence today's program, I want to share with you all a profound quote from Swami Mukundananda Ji, founder of JK Yog, a Vedic scholar and mind management expert. If our mind goes astray, it robs our inner joy dragging us into a cesspool of miserable thoughts and feelings. But if effectively trained, the mind becomes our biggest resource for optimism, contentment, determination, and joyfulness. So as you can see, mental health is vital for overall health and well-being. According to the World Health Organization, Globally, more than 300 million people, irrespective of age, suffer from depression, making it the leading cause of disability worldwide. To enlighten us on this very topic of mental health and depression, we are delighted to have with us today internationally renowned and eminent psychiatrist, Dr. Madhukar Trivedi. Dr. Trivedi is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at UT Southwestern Medical Center, Dallas. He serves as the chief of the Division of Mood Disorders and the founding director of the Center for Depression Research and Clinical Care, where he holds the Betty Jo Hay Distinguished Chair in Mental Health and the Julie K. Hirsch Chair for depression research and clinical care. He specializes in treating depression. Dr. Trivedi earned his medical degree at Baroda Medical College in India, where he also completed a residency in psychiatry. He performed a second residency in psychiatry at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, Michigan, and received advanced training in functional brain imaging and psychopharmacology through a research fellowship at UT Southwestern. Dr. Trivedi is an internationally recognized translational researcher focusing on developing and validating biosignatures of depression. He also conducts research on pharmacological, psychosocial, and non-pharmacological treatments for depression. He has been a principal investigator on numerous transnational research projects as well as clinical trials, has authored more than 500 peer-reviewed scholarly articles, numerous abstracts and book chapters, and has delivered more than 200 invited lectures. Dr. Trivedi is president-elect of the American Society of Clinical psychopharmacology, and a member of numerous other professional organizations. He has been named a Texas Monthly Super Doctor multiple times, including in 2018, and has received numerous local and international accolades, including the Gerald K. Klerman Award from the National Depressive and Manic, Manic Depressive Association Scientific Advisory Board the Psychiatric Excellence Award from the Texas Society of Psychiatric Physicians, and many more. Dr. Trivedi was listed by Thomas Routers, World Most Influential Scientific Minds, as one of the nation's most highly cited researchers in psychiatry in 2014, 2015, and 2017. A quick note before we get started. We will have a brief Q&A after the presentation. So if you have any questions, go ahead and submit your questions in the chat window. With that, it is my privilege to welcome Dr. Trivedi. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Thank you all for attending and uh, it is my pleasure to be here. I'm going to take the next 30, 40 minutes to try to give you a sense of how does the mind and body connect and where do these non-medication based approaches come into play for mental health? Uh, uh, my center is, is focused on really early detection, early intervention and prevention strategies for depression. So 
even though my fo my interest in my research is on biology and studying the brain and treatments with medication psychotherapy, my real interest is trying to figure out what are the best ways we can use to use to to detect depression early, uh, use the best interventions, which it doesn't always have to be medications, but most importantly, really get into prevention strategies because. Almost 60% of people with depression and anxiety actually have their first episode before the age of 18. That tells us that if we can stop it in the early phases, it can actually improve some people's lives throughout their life. It is a common illness. One in 11 people will experience. So if you know 20 people, that means two of them have had depression at some point in their lives. So all of us at least know 50, 60 people tells you you know at least eight to ten people who have depression. I often talk about this in large gatherings and ask people to raise their hand to say how many of you have personally had, family had, or somebody you know have depression. And a lot of hands go up and I, and I, you, I generally joke slightly about it and say those of you who didn't raise your hands is only because people in your life have not told you they've had depression because it is so common. So we should think of this, we should recognize that this is a very common illness and we should not ignore it. As I mentioned, half the people are diagnosed before the age of 30, so that is really means that most people, unlike dementias and other long, chronic medical diseases, experience it early in life and suffer from it throughout their lifetime. Uh, <clears throat> one of the major problems in for depression anxiety in this country and in, in India also is that people don't wait until there is like an emergency. So somebody is suicidal or they cannot go to work, only then they get diagnosed. So if you look at this cascade, it tells you that of the people with depression, only half of them actually ever get diagnosed. Of those who get diagnosed, only half of them even get treated. Bottom line is only about 6%, a small number of people with depression actually get better. And there are many reasons. One of them is really stigma. So, uh, in fact, if, you, if I can convince all of you today to remember one thing, it would be that uh, that really depression is common and it is common in Indians also. And yet when you look at families and if you, and I've done studies with the with Indian uh, uh, populations, under recognition of depression in our communities is even higher. So therefore we should really be thinking about how we want to change this. The, as I mentioned, the big challenge is in youth and it affects their schoolwork, their uh, suicide attempts and then the difficulty with drugs and alcohol and their legal difficulties. What are the risk factors that everybody asks me, is it genetic? Uh, unfortunately, the same question can be asked about diabetes or hypertension or heart disease. Nobody does that, whereas in, me in mental health, everybody says, is it running in your families? The short answer is yes, genetics plays a role. But it doesn't explain everything. So environmental stresses, loss in early life, stressors in early life. There are other kinds of environmental stressors. And then both of these go into the developing brain and the brain doesn't actually function properly is why there is depression. And so depression, anxiety is a brain disease. The common symptoms of depression include sad mood. Sometimes people describe it differently. They feel like they're not able to do their activities. They don't enjoy doing things. They also have other symptoms like difficulty with sleep, appetite, feeling worthless, helpless, hopeless, uh, fatigue, decreased concentration, and most importantly, unfortunately, thoughts of suicide. There are about 48,000 suicides in the United States every year. More people die from suicide than they die from breast cancer every year. So this is a very fatal illness and so we should not ignore it again. Symptoms can not only be the symptoms I mentioned earlier, like depressed mood, etc. There are also physical symptoms. There's a lot of people who will experience the body aches and pains, energy level is down, and as I mentioned, appetite, sleep, and then there are <clears throat> vascular changes in the brain or body. Uh, 
and then cognitive symptoms like negative thinking. One example of negative thinking, when somebody has doesn't have ever had depression, if you run into some bad comment from someone, you might get affected for a second, but then you move on. You say maybe they were in a bad mood, etc. Somebody with depression then keeps on thinking about it. It's as if there is like a loop of thinking that goes on. And they cannot stop thinking about the negative things. In children and youth, one of the main changes you see is changes in personality and isolation. So that kids who were very friendly, they had a lot of friends, suddenly step, keep staying in their room. They don't go out to parties. They don't go out to meet with their friends. Even if you call them, they're not interacting. There are drop in grades. There's a change in group of friends. Uh, their absences in school, they don't do well in school. They change in their dressing and hygiene is impaired. So they're not putting on their clothes and, uh, and they're not make, taking good care of themselves. So what can we do? I think the primary thing is screening and routine measurement. So if somebody has depression, they should be seen by their primary care physician or a pediatrician and measurements of what they are doing on a regular basis should be really a key area. And then early recognition is even more important. Do not let, if you have to connect, come in touch with teenagers or young adults, do not explain their behavior as bad behavior. If that is what they are seeing week after week, days and or months at a time, it could be depression and they should be assessed by a doctor. They are obviously, we have to be very careful about suicide because suicide itself is very devastating. It Not only somebody's life is gone, but people around them will con always have a scar if they are experienced. In fact, most of us, if you stop back to think, even if you're not related to somebody, if you know of someone who has attempt, had committed suicide, that is something that memory sticks with you. Imagine how bad it would be for somebody who is in the family who has experienced suicide in their loved ones. The risk factors of suicide are many. Hopelessness, impulsivity, uh, problem solving difficulties, hostility, aggression, drugs and alcohol use is a very big risk factor for suicide. Family discord is another one. And <clears throat> availability of guns and lethal agents, in, especially increasingly in the United States. There are a lot of protective factors and parents can actually go a long way in helping them with this strong personal relationships. I tell people all the time that not only should you be involved with your children and teenagers' lives, but they should, you should facilitate so they have parent substitutes, uncles and aunts and, and uh, extended family who they can go to. Helping them with religious and spiritual beliefs. And so I'm so glad that the, this organization is doing this because that is another place where we can make an impact. Helping them learn about positive coping strategies, deciding on future goals, and making sure that they are in treatment if somebody has depression. Why do we talk about all this and how does actually being uh, part of this temple and, and this group actually is very interesting because this is where we learn how to do some things and just to give you a sense, if you can imagine what does stress do to the body, it affects a lot of things, including hormones in the brain and in the body. The heart function is affected and there are metabolic changes in the blood that are really negative if somebody has a lot of stress. This stress effect actually is one of the risk factors for depression. There are many ways of overcoming stress. As we know, fear is normal. And <clears throat> we, but facing your fears and overcoming them can actually increase one's self-esteem. So somehow, whenever there is areas in life where you're fearful about performance, about achieving goals, etc., facing their fear and helping people understand that may be one approach to overcoming stress. Chronic stress affects the brain in very negative ways. One of the main areas is circuits in the brain that affects 
So when you, for example, suddenly get negative news or somebody is talking to you and, or behaving poorly towards you, first and foremost, the amygdala and the hippocampus negatively react. If that kind of stress is constant, then the function of the amygdala and hippocampus is actually negatively affected, which is this red area. And that is really where the beginnings of this dysfunction starts. And so treatments often have to then correct it with medications, with psychotherapy, by learning itself. Uh, it also affects indirectly from there parts of the brain that control or provide some corrective action. So when you feel negative, this lower part of the brain, the hippocampus, amygdala, they react negatively. But in general, for people who don't have depression, the prefrontal cortex is able to, so to speak, provide a check. It almost tells this lower part of the brain that it's okay, this is not a permanent thing, that somebody said negative things, but that, that, that doesn't mean that is the end of the world. Some people who have depression, this circuit is actually not functioning properly. And in fact, now recently, new treatments have been developed where you can stimulate this part of the brain to provide that control over this lower part of the brain. And that is one of the treatments that is currently being used in routine practice called magnetic stimulation of the brain. There are other parts of the system. So what, what for the longest time, Brain science told us that these effects that you see with stress, et cetera, are permanent, that brains, neurons do not actually regenerate. What we are now finding out is that that is not true, that the brain is plastic and you can transform the brain so that experiences lead to both negative and positive. And the whole idea of yoga, meditation, et cetera, is a very good model. I'll show you some of the data that we know from human studies that this kind of mindfulness, meditation, concentration, I think, <clears throat> Uh, Raghuniji already started with what, what Swamiji tells us, that kind of thinking when you put into practice, not just hear the words, but you put into practice, can improve this plasticity of the brain and improve these circuits that we saw are, negative, are uh, impaired. So that's one approach to thinking about this. There are many treatments available for the treatment of depression, anxiety, and Again, I'm not going to go into all that. We'll, we'll leave enough time for questions if people have some questions about it. One thing that I wanted to focus on and give you some sense of where mindfulness, meditation, etc., fits into this whole idea of improving brain function is mindfulness, as you all know, is awareness that emerges through pain, paying attention. We, in our day-to-day -day lives, are always as they and and there are this is something that our religious books and Swamiji has always talked to us about is we spend most of our time either worrying about the future or trying to rehash the past and don't pay enough attention to the present and I think mindfulness is really an attempt at trying to help us understand how to do that because as we all know intellectually, but we don't be behave in that way. And that is, the past is gone. We cannot do anything. And the future is only as good or bad as what you do in the present. And that is what mindfulness and meditation actually teach us. <clears throat> this is just a cartoon, but mind the difference between mindful and and mindful <clears throat> being a fool is not too, too big. Uh, when people have studied, we, we just either people who have no depression or those who have depression, anxiety, high blood pressure, etc. And I'll show you a series of all that data. It shows that people not one time and not two times, but regular meditation has positive effects on the very structures and function in the brain that are seen to be abnormal in people who have depression. So like the prefrontal cortex circuit, as I showed you earlier, that is the breaks or the control over the lower part of the brain. When you have people who meditate regularly, 
this part of the brain becomes more thicker and is able to actually perform better and prevent depression from occurring. Similarly, the connections between that part and the lower part through the insula is also improved. There are many other components of brain function that have been studied. One of them is this idea of neuroplasticity, so that brain's ability to change this function in response to meditation has been proven by many studies. <clears throat> uh, one of them is looking at just the gray matter, the part of the brain that actually is very active when you are trying to perform some activity. That Those parts, especially those circuits that are, again, think of the brain as a set of circuits, like a computer circuits. That circuit that is affected with emotions and negative emotions, that gets better when people who are meditators, and you can see the difference here, these are the regions of the circuits, and this is the MRI volumes, so that you can see that the volume here is higher than the volume in just controls who didn't use meditation. People who have, the, 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 this study looked at people who were long-term meditators, and there, actually, these particular circuit parts that were, remember I showed you what is negatively affected with chronic stress, those negatively affected regions actually get much better in people who are long-term meditators. And that is, you can see that, and their rates of depression are obviously much lower. And there are people who ask about what kind of meditation, and I can tell you there are now several studies that have looked at meditation in people who use different approaches to meditation, and it seems very clear that it doesn't actually matter what method you use as long as you use meditation. And as going back to the same point I made earlier, as long as you're trying to focus on the here and now, and begin to learn how to solve the problem so that your fears about the future, your ability to actually navigate negative things in the future are all improved. And that is whether you use Buddhist tradition, Hindu tradition, any meditation approach. In addition to looking at the brain structure and function, people have looked at electrical activity in people who have med used meditation, and here again you see improvements in this gamma oscillations which suggest like you're more alert about what is going on, you're more ca ca capable of being able to navigate and problem solve, and that is what is needed, that is what indicates with gamma oscillations. <clears throat> Mindfulness-based stress reduction therapy, people have used not only meditation, to improve how you feel, but people, uh, there have been studies, this is an eight-week program class for using meditation-based stress reduction. So the stress reduction is a goal, but the approach to reducing stress is, mi is mindful mindfulness. And they used <coughs> sitting meditation, gentle yoga, walking, silent meditation, eating, all of it actually has been shown to work in improving brain structure and function. It has been shown to improve sleep, so this is some that may apply to a lot of us. If you are just uh, <clears throat> looking at patient people who are nappers versus those who watch TV, and these are college students were either were asked to either go take a nap or meditate or watch TV, and then they were tested for alertness by being asked to hit a button. And those meditators this is college students, so they are performing at their very best. You can imagine these are young people, and yet those who had, were doing meditation, they did better than those who took a nap or were watching TV. So all of us who go home and watch TV, maybe we switch what we do. Not only is, does it improve mental health and brain function, but it has effects on other parts of the body also. So this is a study showing improvement in blood pressure change for pe people who were high, had high blood pressure for three months, they did meditation, and 40 of the 60 people who were studied showed drops in blood pressure. 
Med meditation also can help you control your thoughts. And I think this is another part that we add in therapy simultaneously because one thing, common problem with people who have depression and anxiety is they get into the loop of thinking about the same thing. It's almost like a broken record. They are going through all the negative things and meditation is able, is able to actually help you control that so that you can then pay attention to other parts of your life. They, one aspect of uh, looking at how vibrant your body and is, is really can be looked at through something called a telomere length, which is the end uh, parts of the gene. And, and so 265 year olds, when you compare them, you can find that some people have lived a life with, with less stress, have figured out a better living approach. Their telomere's length is actually longer, suggesting that even though they both may be 65 years in age from a numerical point of view, their body age for some people who are using meditation regularly is actually low, small, younger or so that you can you see this in routine life also there are people who look and behave younger and their mind is very vibrant that is an example outwardly but you can even test it through their genetic code simple things like doing a psychological stress test so if you get, and it's this is called a Trier social stress test. This is actually an interesting uh, experiment. You, what we do, I, I do these also. What we do is you invite four, five people at, at least, or ten, up to ten people in one room, and ask one of them to stand up and give a ten-minute talk. And the amount of stress somebody experiences when you suddenly throw somebody in that position is actually quite significant. And that it, you can measure. And if you have a group of people who had meditation or mindfulness-based <clears throat> stress reduction training, they are able to withstand the stress much more easily. And you will be surprised People who are very high functioning also, when exposed to this tria social stress test, they have significant physiological changes and this can actually be improved with meditation. So it can help in normal day-to-day -day life also. So I'm going to stop here and open up for questions. I think that uh, the way to think about it is this there was a, there's a lot of people in my field and in general medical field who might describe this as a little bit of hocus pocus, but that is because I think we always there are we are always in fads. So if you think about this, this is sort of one cartoonish way of talking about it. But people in the five in 500 BC were saying eat a root, and then you know there is a whole field of Ayurvedic medicine in India. Similarly, in the in, in 1900s, they thought of these potions as snake oil. Then in 45, the pill is ineffective, take this antibiotic, and then the, <clears throat> we are now beginning to again say that take take these roots from, from Ayurvedic medicine. Like there are now active studies, for example, that have clearly shown improvement in immune function if you use turmeric and now we all use turmeric all the time so there is always a fad but in general mindfulness based treatments meditation etc can easily be seen as an important part that improves brain function and it's my i in my practice routinely suggest some aspect of mindfulness based activity for patients and what each person chooses to do can vary depending on what their expertise and what their interests are. I'm going to stop here for any questions and uh, see whether I can answer them. Uh, thank, uh, you. thank you, Dr. Um, you mentioned something very interesting about mindfulness. Can you tell us, tell our viewers, how exactly they can practice mindfulness. 
So I think you can read about it and then then learn. There, uh, our Swamiji's etc. are very good at helping us learn how to do it. It is really the way we do it is we train our we we do therapy based on mindfulness based stress reduction. So in our experiments, we actually train them on particular aspects. So the mindfulness training we do is about reducing their response to stresses. So we give them exercises to imagine the different kinds of stresses they experience, train them on how to be mindful that this is really, <clears throat> they have to figure out how to disengage from the past, stop worrying about the future and think about what they can do now. And that is what we train them. So there are mindfulness-based training programs there are people who can do it by themselves, but my suggestion generally is to find somebody who can train you on it. Okay. Um, going on to the next one. Um, how to overcome overthinking? So I think again, there are if if it is in the setting of like some kind of mental health, mental illness issue, then you need to get first get assessed and evaluated, and then tr start treatment. If it is outside of that, and if you're in general uh, worrying about the soul or thinking about certain things, there are meditation or mindfulness exercises one can do and again they are different people for different people it's a either you have been trained or you can sit there are people who have used meditation when they were younger and they can sit in front of some stable situation and meditate that's another approach uh, but it is takes training it is not something you can tell yourself i'm going to now stop overthinking okay Great point there. So, what you're trying to say, can we, uh, through meditation, can we practice mindfulness? Does that help? Absolutely. Either you can practice it through mind meditation, you can do it with yoga, you can do it with exercise, you can also go and, like our songs, you can teach, uh, train us on uh, meditation, and that is one way of learning about mindfulness too. Oh, great. Uh, one of our viewers has this uh, question and he says that um, sometimes later in life, say after about 50, at 50 years of age, uh, we discovered that we had uh, depression and attention issues. So how do we overcome that at, at a later age? You can get treated at any age. People, in, even in their 70s and 80s, can get treatment and feel profoundly better. There is a whole field of psychiatry called geriatric psychiatry, and uh, treatments work. So I don't think that just because some of you are 50, it is too late. Okay. Um, the next question is, uh, can depression run in the family? And if it does, uh, can it be avoided? So depression can run in families. Uh, the rate, the the, but but the genetic contribution for depression is not very strong. So therefore, people who have mother or father with depression have a higher risk for depression, but it is not 100%. And uh, you can't really get rid of your family. So I think so. that's one thing. The second part is Genetics or family history is just one small part of it. It is then the stresses somebody experiences, how they deal with the stresses, and how they actually incorporate protective factors, as I mentioned earlier, making sure you have very good social connections, trying to practice yoga or meditation or some self-relaxation approaches, and being in connection with family and friends, etc., uh, all can be used as protection against developing depression. And once you have it, then it is better to get treated. Yeah. I just want to highlight one thing. People worry about this for depression, anxiety, and mental health. 
they often don't worry about it with diabetes. Just because your mother or father had diabetes, your chances of getting diabetes are higher doesn't mean you start saying, how do I change my family, right? All right. Uh, staying on the topic of uh, depression, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about postpartum depression? And uh, I have often heard that it often goes unnoticed. Is that true? And, and if a person is suffering from postpartum depression, how soon can they start meditating? So this is a very important topic and I'm glad you brought it up because uh, first, there is something called postpartum blues which is a brief period of several days to a couple of weeks or three weeks where women are just after delivery have spells of up and down changes in their mood, often associated with the fact that they have a lot of sleepless nights during that time. And that generally is worrying to the mother and the, and the family, but it goes away. There are the one way to solve or address that is to provide some rest to the young mother. Then there is a whole group of uh, then there is the group of women who develop what is called postpartum depression, and that group of women have depression that lasts beyond those three weeks and becomes very significant. They start having symptoms, as I mentioned earlier, that are sad mood and they, not, they don't feel like taking care of the infant, which is unusual for a mother. They also have changes in their appetite and in concentration. They feel helpless, hopeless. And that is something that should be treated. It should be treated like any other medical disease. So they should, the mother should, or the husband or the family should actually make sure that the OBGYN or the primary care physician knows about it. There are very good treatments available. In fact, uh, one of the most, most exciting advances in my field has been a new treatment that just was approved over the last two years for specifically for postpartum depression which is one treatment session, unfortunately it lasts 60 hours, so it is often four or five days of IV injection. But that one treatment episode takes care of the full episode of depression. So that also tells you that a treatment that is approved is a, a hormone called allopregnenolone, which is similar to female hormones called pregnenolone. And so <clears throat> these treatments work. There is a very small per percentage of women whose postpartum depression becomes so intractable and severe that they develop what is postpartum psychosis. And these are, the, these are very severe postpartum depression and that is much more dangerous. This is the, kind, this is the type of postpartum depression where there are high rates of suicide and even sometimes infanticide so that the infant is also killed by the mother and then they take their own life. That is a medical emergency and somebody should really take care of that through medical treatment rather than staying at home. Remember one other thing related to this so the different is that unfortunately depression is twice as common in women than it is in men. In fact, boys and girls have the same rate of depression until they hit puberty. As soon as they hit puberty, girls' rates of depression double and they stay double all the way into menopause. And uh, we don't know exactly the reason, but hormonal changes, stressors in life, all seem to have a very important role. My wife thinks it's also because women have to deal with men, but that's a different problem. Well, that could be one, for sure. So, uh, one of our viewers wants to know that, is there some connection between B-complex deficiency and depression? So, there is uh, people, people who have vitamin B12 deficiency can experience depressive symptoms. Vitamin B12 deficiency is not very common, but it is possible and they have, to, they have symptoms of depression. Vitamin B12 deficiency can be present as depression, 
thyroid problems can present as depression. There are other uh, endocrine problems like pituitary organ problems, uh, adrenal gland problems that can also present as depression. So there are a number of medical illnesses they, for whom the first symptom could be depression. In fact, pancreatic cancer, one of the early symptoms of the pancreatic cancer often can also be depression. Okay. In that case, how would you tell them apart? How, how would you know that a person has higher problems and not a depression? So, so I, I think there are two things. things. One is, uh, in, like if you, nobody says you have hypertension, take care of it at home on your own, right? Similarly, the first issue is once you suspect that you or somebody in your family has likely to be depression, you should get a medical opinion. So that's the first thing. But, and so don't make your own decision, this is depression and not cancer or something. The second thing is most physicians, when they make a diagnosis of depression, will go through history and decide if the presentation is such that it is clearly depression or does require some tests to rule out some of these things, and they will do it very carefully. Right. Are there any herbal treatments to calm the mind? Pardon me? Are there any herbal treatments to calm the mind? So there are, uh, it is an interesting question, and what to be, to be transparent, one of the problems with the, with the answering that question is a lot of herbal treatments have had some signals, but not enough study to be able to convincingly say one way or the other. So there are a lot of Ayurvedic treatments that there are small case reports but no full-fledged randomized trials. That is the biggest problem. As I mentioned to you, curcumin, which is basically turmeric, has now a couple of small trials showing efficacy for improving symptoms of depression. So there are these <clears throat> natural treatments that could be, uh, ginseng is another one that could be seen as SAMI is available at uh, <coughs> over-the-counter uh, sort of nutrition stores. They all have some signals for depression, but even if that is true, I very seriously uh, advise people not to make that your only treatment. It doesn't matter what treatment you take, but you should be under the care of a doctor. Because when that treatment, even if it works, even the regular antidepressant treatments like Prozac, when even though we can say they work, they're not 100% effective. So when they don't work, uh, danger is around the corner because then it can lead to suicide, etc. So even if you think you want to try out something natural, exercise, we've done national trials funded by NIH, that show that aerobic exercise also works for depression. But I would caution people from using it on your own without getting it under the care of the physician. Right. Um, I, I want to get my hair cut. I don't cut it myself. I go to somebody who will cut my hair. If you have a mental health issue, it is really important. We should not take it lightly. And I think there is a tendency uh, on everybody's part to write it off because we don't. There's not a rate like a something that you can see easily. Great. So uh, the next question is from our viewer who wants to who's asking about their nine-year-old son, and uh, she says that he complains about bullying in his school and has few friends. He has trouble sleeping through the night feeling sad and incomplete most often and the counselor uh, said that he has anxiety and the question is what should I do? So, so I, I think, think uh, uh, if the counselor is already involved, that is very nice, very good news. They should listen to the counselor, monitor the person, the, the, the child's uh, symptoms, keep an eye on their sleep, appetite, etc. There are checklists available. 
or I, somebody can email me, I'm happy to send out the list of checklists that you can check so that you keep as a parent keep track of it. Keep in touch with the counselor and if it is, he's not getting better, then we have, you have to figure out and either get the counselor to change the treatment or find somebody else because don't stick with somebody if your treatment is not working. Uh, what kinds of treatments? Obviously, counseling is really very good and it works. Play therapy works at that age, so that you put them in group, play, play groups. Uh, exercise is another one. Exercise is not like walking in the park, but exercise which is aerobic exercise with significant intensity. All have been shown to work, but they may not be sufficient and may need the medication. In which case, you have to go see a doctor. Okay. Our next viewer's question is, um, he is only 24 years old and he has a lot of anxiety due to overthinking. And he says that if he sees something bad happening around, he starts imagining that it is happening to him. And he sometimes cannot sleep because of that in the night. And um, he says that he's not able to discuss this with anyone else as um, it is a taboo to discuss this in India. And he feels helpless all the time. Uh, what can he do? How old is he? 24. I think go see a primary care physician right away. This is not normal, so then don't ignore it. Um, what are some preventive techniques for depression that you can suggest for children? So, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, one is uh, teaching them social connectedness so that they have a social group of friends and family members with whom they have full trust so that they can actually come to them when they are facing dilemmas, problems, they are, they are having overthinking situations they are able to go to them for support. So having a good social connectedness is very important. Second part is uh, <clears throat> uh, having a couple of confidants, whether it is friends, family, brother, sister, or even a parent or uncle or aunt. Thirdly, I, at least for kids and young people, I suggest to parents and even kids to find mentors or parent substitutes. So just having parents is wonderful and caring parents is wonderful. But having another two or one or two adults that can also be a sounding board when they run into problems is another protective method. Engaging in physical activity, exercise, etc. is another way to pre prevent and protect yourself. Getting engaged in spiritual and religious activity has been shown, so going to Mandir and trying to connect with whatever aspect of because aspect of religion that they can talk and that they, they like or they can actually find peace in is another one. Uh, <clears throat> um, I, I think and being and giving and parents and, and adults in their family give them permission to express concerns or problems they run into so that they don't have to hide. Like the 24-year-old you were saying says, I'm afraid to tell people in India that sort of thing happens even here. So that should be another thing, giving them permission to be able to express some of the negative things they experience. All go to great too. To. Finally, uh, some figuring out a way to be able to help them learn how to engage in giving to somebody, volunteering or, uh, or, or helping somebody in need. Okay, moving on to the next question. Does the individual's thinking style or other mindset play a part in bringing on depression? I think that that is a very interesting question. The, sh the short answer is it is not a straightforward relationship. People who have negative mindset do have a slightly higher rate of depression, but it is not a one-to-one -one relationship. So even if somebody has a negative mindset, uh, that doesn't automatically lead to depression, but it is good for them to learn to 
let go of the negative mindset or figure out behavioral techniques, you can learn this protective me mechanisms I mentioned. Similarly, you can learn ways of undoing negative thinking uh, if somebody is serious. What is the, the remedy for depression caused due to pancreatitis, pan pancreatitis in children? No, pancreatic cancers, they're never, they're not an issue in children. Well, that was a viewer question, so I'm not sure. Um, I think I do want to go back to the old, the earlier question about once you have a negative mindset or once you have something, then can it change? I, I mean, I, I think our religion in some ways, I'm not, a, I'm not a, in any way a big uh, master of this, but we maybe ask Swamiji to comment on it. But it, it is like saying that because you, you're, you're destined or karma to do this, you just don't do anything, doesn't work. And you, even if you have a negative mindset, there are ways of relearning so that you can actually overcome it. Anything an individual can do on their own to relieve the depression when it is a mind form of depression when it's not chronic? I think like all these protective approaches we mentioned do apply to adults also and you can use them to improve your depression or reduce the severity of depression. I very strongly <coughs> would suggest strongly that even if you want to try that, it is still worthwhile getting a consultation with a physician so that you know that somebody is monitoring how you're doing, even if you're trying to do it on your own without any medication or treatment. If someone has been uh, diagnosed with uh, chronic, chronic depression, what are the treatment options available to them? What are what? If someone is uh, diagnosed with chronic depression, what are the treatment options available to them? So there are very many extensive treatments. I don't think that was the real topic today, so I didn't include that. But there are over 35 to 40 new uh, med medications that are available uh, that have been approved by the FDA, including Prozac, Zoloft, Paxil, Belbutrin, and many others, new ones. There is also very exciting new study, new uh, medications being approved these days, which are very targeted, like esketamine, which is, works through a different mechanism than, say, Prozac. So there is about 40 medications available. There are psychotherapies of many kinds that where they teach. Basically, you're learning how to navigate all this and try to understand how best to solve the problems that you're talking about with somebody guiding you uh, and uh, not on your own, but having somebody teach you all that, that's psychotherapy. There are magnetic stimulation, so that is like, a, like an MRI machine, you sit in it and it taps you and improves the circuits in the brain. Uh, there is exercise, as I mentioned, we have to do it with rigorous intensity, et cetera, four or five times a week. We have studied it and 1200 kilocalories of energy expenditure per week can help. And then there are the ECT in very severe cases. Okay, so if someone is uh, on antidepressants, what are, what are the side effects that they have to be aware of? Depends on the medication. There are many different side effects for different medications. Most of the side effects are mild or, and can be managed easily. In some people, the side effect for a particular antidepressant may be more severe, like nausea, weight gain, uh, uh, some degree of agitation sometimes. But that is rare, small amounts, and when that happens, you change that to another medication. And there, as I mentioned, there are 30, 40 available. So if this, this group doesn't work, you can go to another one. Okay. Um, now, uh, coming to these current uh, challenging times uh, of the pandemic, in your experience, uh, what have you seen has uh, depression increased during the pandemic? Are people being more anxious? or the, the fact that they are isolated and not being able to meet with people contributed to 
anxiety or depression? Uh, yes, the rates of depression and anxiety are increasing, and I think in, in terms of mental health issues, and especially depression, anxiety, substance use, probably we don't have data on this, so I can't say for sure. But in our, so in our in our uh, population, but in the general population, rates of domestic violence are increasing, and uh, it is a good. Uh, back to the, to the mental health pandemic is actually just beginning to show up. Okay. Uh, going back to the same question, so how can someone who is dealing with being isolated uh, actually uh, cope with what would you say to someone who is dealing with isolation? How can they cope with this? So first and foremost, I think we have to take our mindset totally and take, turn it around. Just because you're social, uh, socially distant doesn't mean you're socially unconnected. So just because you have to stay at home doesn't mean you don't remain connected with people. You may be physically disconnected, but not visually, etc. Now, as you 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 know this, there is like 40 different approaches. You guys uh, want to use Teams? I use Zoom. Somebody uses Google Hangouts. In many ways. So first, actively plan on remaining connected with the people you used to be connected with. If you didn't have a pandemic, you would have a list of, or a group of people you would see regularly. So can figure out a way to do that. Call relatives, uncles, aunts, grandparents, children, and make a schedule. Uh, <clears throat> do not overdo the sort of same uh, uh, TV or computer activities like people sit in front of news for five hours and try to keep track. Figure out a smaller number of responsible news outlets you like and you just focus on that and the rest of the time find some activity. In that Texas at least over the next couple of months we'll see it's cold but you can go out for a walk. There is enough space. So continue all those activities Remain safe, but social physical distance should not mean you are socially distant. And then, if none of these things work and symptoms, uh, and your dis your concerns continue, please can go get a get a consultation. Right, uh, some great tips there, Dr. Trivedi. Uh, what is the best way to help or support someone whom we know has depression? I think that uh, uh, the simplest thing is show concern, be direct, do not uh, be afraid to raise it. So if I know you, I, will, I should come and tell you that I have noticed that there is a significant change. These are the things I am noticing. You don't respond, return my calls, you don't do this, you don't cook or whatever that you used to do. I am concerned. Hear them out what they are explaining and then say, I hear you, but I would like to have you go and get a medical opinion. Go see your primary care physician. Uh, if they are younger, like parents ask me all the time, I am 15 year old, I don't want to put the thought of depression in them. And I can tell you, not even depression, but suicide, they worry even more about asking. You know, I routinely tell them, I have two boys and they are now older. If my asking them was, or telling them was, it's going to be sufficient for them to do everything I want them to do, my life would have been nirvana. They don't. They're just asking them doesn't put the idea in them. It actually relieves them. Feels They feel like you care, that you're asking. So if they're younger, you should ask and take them to see someone. You don't want to play a doctor for your own family members. Okay. Uh, recently in the media, there has been a lot of talk on psychedelics for depression. What are your thoughts on this? It's a very new field, very intriguing, very exciting. I'm doing studies with it, but this is still in the research arena. I would say stay away from it until we, we all can prove this is this works, it is safe, it's effective. Until then, 
Uh, I can talk about it, about the research, but in, in, for the general public, this is not the time to start running into, uh, you start using it. But more and more states are making it uh, illegal, isn't that? Pardon me? More and more states are making it legal now, so... Uh, yeah. Yeah. But we don't, we don't have, we don't have enough evidence right now it's like the back, you know, six months back, we were having that type of conversation for vaccines, that, does it work or not? At that time, it was premature. Now it looks like there is good evidence. So we want to wait until then. But having said that, I think there is something interesting that is happening with that research. We'll see what it shows. There is some data showing that it's the mystical experience that people have, have on the psychedelics that is associated with it. So, we'll see. I don't know. Okay, I think we have uh, time for just one more question. Um, is uh, depression related to or the result of prolonged anxiety? That is, a uh, short answer is, it is definitely related to it. Uh, a lot, there is a sizable proportion of people who have depression, uh, if you carefully get their history out, they experienced significant anxiety as a first set of symptoms before they got to depression. So a lot of people when I have get take history or there's data showing the same, who have depression in their 30s and 40s, in their teens actually started with anxiety. So there is a relationship. Okay. But not everybody with anxiety ends up developing depression. Great point there. Um, a viewer wants to know that uh, if uh, restricting the uh, using gadgets for entertainment during this pandemic, when they are distance learning and have no social interaction with their friends, make them more rebellious and stressed? Uh, somewhat. I mean, I think that uh, they are, the teens and young and kids are feeling stressed because uh, the natural thing for teen, kids, kids to do is to go to school and be with a whole bunch of kids. This has been a year where they have not had that chance, so they are feeling isolated and stressed. Uh, and that is a fact. I think the way to think about it is to create uh, activity for them that at least begins to mimic some of it, but it still is going to leave some, uh, some things not available. Uh, you're coming across unclear. What say that again if you don't mind? It has been told that by regular practice we can rewire our brains neurons to acquire a desired successful mindset. What are your comments on this? I think that is exactly what neuroplasticity is. That's what I was describing at the beginning. Yes, the results, the results I don't know, but desired changes in the brain. Yes, the, my, <clears throat> it, that these kinds of activities can and does rewire the brain neurons and uh, can be used for your benefit by doing it appropriately, absolutely. Okay, I think uh, we can take one more last question before we uh, wrap up. Are there any objective tests or biochemical parameters which can be used to follow the course of depressive neurosis in patients? So I, I think that is very kind of a sense of the research I am currently conducting. So it is still early, but we are beginning to identify proteins in the blood and some circuits in the brain using EEG and MRI 
that can be used to monitor progress and, and decide which treatment is better for which patient. And uh, so there are EEG and brain tests and some initial blood tests like C-reactive protein, we published extensively on that, can be used as a marker to decide what treatment is better than some other treatment. Okay, um, that uh, brings us to the end of our uh, session today. On uh, behalf of Ekayog and Radha Krishna Temple of Dallas, I would like to express our appreciation to uh, Dr. Trivedi for sharing and walking us through the many aspects of depression. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Trivedi for being here despite your very hectic schedule. Uh, many thanks once again. Uh, we have two exciting events coming up. Uh, on Sunday is a special satsang with Swamiji at 10.30 a.m. and it will be broadcasted live on YouTube. For now, uh, thank you all for uh, tuning in, and uh, I hope you will join us next Friday on our next health webinar. Thank you, and have a great weekend. Thank you.